everyone and thank you for joining. Welcome to today's session entitled Procurement and Lightning Talks. My name is Frederick Magana and I'll be moderating this session. A recorded version of this webinar will be available to all attendees. Well, we'd like to hear from you and engage with you during this session. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, ask your questions by typing it in the chat button, uh, Q&A Q in the lower button of the control panel. For those of us who are still joining, welcome. We'll get it started by jumping onto the agenda and the program of this day. I understand we have attendees who are coming from different parts of the world, welcome. So we'll have a presentation by our panelists which comprises of five speakers who will discuss their favorite procurement topics. These speakers are Fatma al kathiri Stan Kablakubo, Jennifer Atanga Akongbota, Zia Mahmoud Ahmed, Ludmila, Dr. Ludmila Prozorova. We'll also have a Q&A session and a closure. I'd like to take this opportunity to let you know that this event is brought to you by SIPS MENA Abu Dhabi branch. Please feel free to connect with the committee members as you can see them right there in social media and engage with them. Don't hesitate to ask them questions because they are one of uh, the subject and math experts and they were selected to be part of the committee to just improve and uh, be uh, an addition to your, uh, to your network. Now, without further ado, we are gonna get it started. So what is procurement and lightning talks? Basically lightning talk is a way whereby you provide knowledge, understanding, by a micro presentation or a pitch of some sort. In this session, you'll see our presenters who are able to share their bizarre ideas on projects, best practices, concepts, and uh, lesson learned. And the name of the game is going to be just to stay focused. In essence, this session was previously uh, uh, done via face-to-face -face meeting and it will be unfair for me to continue this session without mentioning one and only Mr. Lalit, who was the pioneer of this session. He moderated this session on face-to-face. -face. And there were rules which were supposed to be adhered to during this session. One of the rules would be the speakers need to be able to present their ideas concisely within five minutes Essentially, in a face-to-face -face session, there should be a timer. Once the speakers get to finish their, uh, presenting their ideas, we'll have an opportunity to ask them questions. Or if there are no questions from the audience, they can ask themselves questions and answer uh, just to enable the audience understand what they're talking about. One of the rules is to speak onto the microphone and look directly into the camera to avoid looking on the presentation. And last but not least, just like we say in procurement, time is of essence. You want your point to be strong and uncluttered. So we are going to start our session and our next, our first presenter is going to be Ms. Fatma al -Kathiri. Please, Ms. Fatma Kathiri, unmute yourself and uh, welcome on board. Hi, and uh, many thanks, uh, Frederick, uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to be here with you uh, on this platform in, uh, into the series of the Enlightening uh, Talk. So, uh, Fred, I just want to check before we start, uh, shall I share my screen from my side or uh, it will be from your side, just just to be uh, aware of it. 
So uh, Fatma, I'll be driving the session. I have all the slides of the presenters in here. Mm -hmm. And whenever you're ready, please allow me to hit the next button so that I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, and thank we'd, you. We'd love to see you also, thank you. Now you see me. <laughs> yeah, now we can. Thank you, uh, Frederick. Welcome. So um, my talk today is about uh, blockchain and I'm not gonna talk about it uh, as uh, an IT professional. I'm more uh, into an explorer of this new technology and how it would bring the uh, changes or to bring the values into the procurement uh, operations. Uh, my discussion or my, my talk today will be about what is blockchain in very uh, high level and uh, then I would just take you through uh, the supply chain in application in terms of uh, how many industries has started and in what in, in which terms they have been using this uh, technology. Uh, please next, uh, Fred. Yeah. First of all, this is just an overview on the supply chain application. Um, for the, for the supply chain, I mean, we have many stages. And one of the things that the blockchain would provide is having a better visibility and a transparency across the whole chain, uh, starting from the suppliers and, uh, and the suppliers of the raw materials till the end of uh, the chain to the end customers. It helped tracking the products, the information, and even the money in very transparent way uh, so uh, to avoid, for example, any kind of uh, uh, manipulation or corruption, it also add value in removing some of the medium in between these stages, regardless if this stage is, uh, for example, within uh, two organization, organization or a big network of a supply chain. This is just to, to give you an overview on uh, in which term the blockchain uh, can be uh, applied. Uh, and this is actually from one of the reports from Deloitte. Um, the first stage in terms of uh, developing uh, and uh, uh, in that time they, they are suggesting to use this in, in gaining greater access to sourcing materials, uh, data to better uh, to inform uh, the, uh, the research and development uh, choices and enable closed loop design. In terms of the plan, increase the opportunities in, uh, in co-planning between uh, two or more than that inter uh, entities in the, in the network. In terms of the sourcing, um, it will help in decreasing the sourcing administration. And this is a great efficiency to be added uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the supply chain cy uh, cycle or process. In terms of the make, uh, the visibility, as I said, and compliance uh, of the outsource uh, manufacturing. In terms of the delivery, it provides the regulators and end customers to have a clear picture uh, about the product in terms of in case if there is any kind of change happened and what are uh, and if the if the sources are legal or uh, from uh, from uh, legal uh, authorities or entities. Uh, last but not least is about the return, which in which uh, it means that it determines which batch to recall based on the information available. Uh, these applications would be more clear once we go into the, uh, the company's experience uh, on how did they use this technology. But first, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Ben. But first, um, I just before I just go to to this uh, to these examples, I would like to um, to give you kind of a flavor on what is really the blockchain. It's 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 mainly um, uh, it's a ledger which have uh, three types of information. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, the ha uh, I mean the hash, which is kind of security one. Uh, the other one is. Uh, the previous hash, which is like number, uh, number, uh, it's another security uh, item, and the third thing is the information uh, recorded into that ledger, and the way that these uh, these uh, these uh, blocks, let's say, are are connected, they are connected in uh, in uh, in a way of chain. So each block will save what has been changed in uh, the previous uh, previous one. And uh, that, for example, would help in terms of, if, in case if you have a system and someone uh, 
uh, hacked it, uh, it will be really impossible uh, or nearly impossible to change the information saved into that, uh, into that uh, ledger. Uh, and that's where it comes that it provides um, uh, transparency and uh, visibility on all the operations that's happening. In addition to that, it is a decentralized system. So, so it can be accessed from anywhere. It doesn't need to be, for example, if we can just uh, think about it like a bank, it doesn't need to be like in the bank, bank uh, place, no. I mean, anyone can just do the transaction without having that medium. I hope that uh, with this, I mean, it's a bit clear on, on, on uh, uh, what is the, uh, the definition of this technology. Now, when it comes to the examples from different industries, uh, there is there's very interesting example, um, and it's a collaboration between Microsoft and Ernest and Young. Uh, they created a blockchain uh, where uh, where it was used to track the attribution of digital content uh, uh, in terms of the video game. Now, this this kind of uh, application is mainly to protect the uh, intellectual properties. So uh, that would help in case if if uh, if the video game, for example, has been copied or uh, have been illegally uh, distributed. The second uh, application is establishing a history of ownership, and that was found uh, between two companies. Uh, one of them is Everledger Limited, which is a company uh, um, specialized in the. Um, in, the, in having the blockchain as one of, of their platforms. And they helped uh, many, uh, many, many, which uh, they helped many organizations in terms of tracking the, uh, the uh, and verifying the luxury goods, uh, luxury of goods. And one of the application was tracking the sources of a diamonds, um, uh, whether it has been uh, purchased from legal, uh, uh, authorities or entities, or it has been um, purchased through the uh, the illegal ones or the what they call it the black market. If you can just please go to the next. The third one is um, in terms of the efficiencies and uh, transparent again. Uh, the, uh, as part of introducing this technology, um, part of it was to work on something called the smart smart contracts. They are digital agreements uh, automatically executed once, a, uh, once an event or requirement has been established in, in, in a blockchain. I would just give you a, a quick uh, example on it, how, how, how it would work. For example, if you have um, a site that work on a lot of operations and one equipment uh, has been, uh, has been uh, diagnosed to be replaced, then uh, uh, there are some technologies explored now that this uh, the, the replacement of this equipment would be triggered into that platform, which make which will make the supplier doing uh, right away the uh, the delivery of the uh, of the equipment that need to be replacing the old one, and the trans transaction will happen directly through the platform. I mean the payment, the agreement, and everything without even interfering or having. Uh, uh, a purchasing entity uh, in the middle or any kind of um, uh, like a bank or, uh, or, uh, or authority that can manage or govern the transaction of, of uh, the money. And all the transactions is happening through using the uh, cryptocurrency uh, uh, in, in this platform. Other examples are here like uh, Mercic and IBM. They did a collaboration in terms of creating a real-time digital ledger for global shipping and other one for Walmart in terms of uh, tracking the food imported to US to assure that they are reaching to their end customer uh, in, uh, in the right condition or in healthy condition. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you so much and hope that you enjoy listening. Thank you. Uh -huh. I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, it was part of the attendees in your previous session about women in procurement. I heard you speaking about the challenges and I heard you speaking about digitalization and what challenges is going to bring to procurement professionals. So 
We'll be having some questions around that at the end of this, uh, this uh, session. But uh, moving forward, uh, I'd like us to get to the next uh, presenter. And that's going to be Stan Kablo Kubok. Please unmute yourself and forgive me if I sounded your name incorrectly. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, thank you very much. So the topic that I selected for today's presentation is the power of subconscious. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So we all think that we control our lives by our conscious mind. We think, we decide, but unfortunately, the study shows that it is it's not. 80% of our brain work is only for subconscious, yeah? Uh, this is the psych psychologist uh, studies. Also the Garvard Business School professor, uh, I don't see the name here, so sorry. Uh, so the Garvard Business School, uh, they made research and they found out that 95% of purchasing decisions are taking place only in the emotional subconscious. So we use, we use uh, tools, we use some systems, but anyway, we're all humans, so we use emotions, subconscious, and this is what's affecting our purchasing decisions a lot. So, and the idea is to be aware of the subconscious uh, and to use it consciously in our lives, in our decisions. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's about communication. Uh, the way uh, the uh, partner, I would say, uh, sees us, uh, the way uh, they perceive us is, uh, in the first five seconds, this is how they're gonna see us in the future, yeah? And it's very important to win trust in this first encounter, yeah? If the opponent or partner likes us, the, the trust is built, yeah? There are, of course, different, different negotiation styles, uh, and all know them, we studied them, it's uh, styles depending on the culture with whom you negotiate, you negotiate differently with Americans, you negotiate differently with the Japanese, or Russians or any other nationality. Yeah, you tailor make your approach to each each, each nationality to get basically the, the best results. Yeah. Also, there is a lot of studies and there is a lot of material how to negotiate, how to present. It's basically body mirroring, form of voice, repeating the last word in the opponent's statement. There are many many tools, and I'm, I'm sure if, uh, if you're don't know already about it, you can find out about it at length. Yeah. But what I found the most important, uh, when people talk to partners, we often uh, misspell or mispronounce the names. And this is normal yeah? in the uh, cultures, in the cities uh, where there are people from many, many, many nationalities, it's always difficult to find and to understand what is the right pronunciation of a name. Uh, one good example, it will be, for example, I didn't put up my presentation, but uh, one good example would be Mohammed, yeah? There is different ways how you spell it, and uh, it's, it's important. Whenever I send the mail to a Mohammed, I make sure that I spell it exactly correct the way he, it should be. Yeah? I'll give example of my name. So my full name is pronounced Stanislav Kablokov. Even my colleagues, after working with me 10 years, some still cannot pronounce it. <laughs> I don't blame them. So I tried to help. Uh, as you can see, the variations that I received is Stanislav, Stanislav, Stan, Stanislav, so you name it at length. Next. Uh, and my favorite, once I received the proposal and the title, it's still, it was several years ago and we were still receiving the uh, proposals in the hard copies and the sealed envelopes. And one of the contractors, they put my name on the envelope and it was, Frederick, Mr. Satan. So these guys really made my day <laughs> by setting their proposal. Uh, I took it to my boss and said, boss, beware. This is how people see me. <laughs> but of course I did nothing. So I just called the guys and said, okay, just in future, uh, pay attention to the name, uh, but don't worry this time, things happen. Yeah. Next, uh, contractual negotiations. Uh, it also comes from my experience. Uh, oh, as a procurement professionals, we always uh, have a targets. Yeah, we need to deliver savings. We need to 
get discount from our suppliers and partners. And usually it is 10%, yeah. Everywhere you go, if, if you go shopping, it's 10%, yeah. I found it uh, frustrating, at least for me. When people come to me and say, yeah, I'll give you 10% discount. I say, no, 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 I don't need it. Do, do something better for me. Even though maybe I was ready for 5%, but because it's so standard these days, I decided not to accept it. During my well, one of the negotiations that I did, I used odd numbers, yeah? And if you see I, in my presentation here, I said, I want 11.3% discount. Uh, when I said this to my opponent, he's, mm, okay, I understand what you mean. Uh, let me uh, work something out for you. And this click in my mind, that in, in my mind, that if you give odd numbers to your partners, yeah, asking for a discount, they think there is a big math. Yeah, if you see on the on the right, there is a picture. There is a big math behind by, behind it. So you're not just you're just asking for a discount to reach your procurement goals, which uh, sales will hate. But you really work it out what you want, and it worked for me not once but several times. Another uh, experience that I want to share is legal comments. When we, when we negotiate the contract, so there's always uh, comments on legal terms and conditions, what they can accept, what we cannot accept. And if you see except this negotiation example down, uh, the table shows that it was quite protracted. At least this is how I perceive it. What I found out is when I spoke to people, we initially we said, Yes, this is a comment, but we don't accept it. That's a period. Yeah, if this is your column three, if you see. But then it was it was going nowhere. Then I decided to give a call and say, you know what? Let, let's go through the list again. Let's talk through about it. And you let me know why you want this or that change. And I'll tell you if I can accept. And if I cannot accept, I'll tell you why I cannot accept. You'll be amazed. We finished conversation in 10 minutes. Everybody was happy. So it's really important not just to say, no, I don't accept it, full stop. It's really important to talk, to tell people why you cannot accept it. In this case, you'll save a lot of time and you get results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Dan. You made me laugh so hard, really. <laughs> when I was compiling this presentation, uh, I, I was quite, I was quite concerned with that picture, and I was like, "Which concept of procurement is this that Stan is going to, to, to share with everybody?" But now I know, and I like that. I really like the fact that you've introduced, you know, odd numbers and how to how to collaborate with uh, with, with your with your with, with your stakeholders and to present yourself with. With, with, a, with an objective outcome. We'll get back to some questions uh, at the end of session, but uh, moving forward, Absolutely. moving forward, I, 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 I like to say really thank you, Stan, for that uh, presentation. You took eight minutes. <laughs> no, sorry, I will run, sorry. <laughs> no, don't, don't be sorry, it's all right. Moving forward, you're gonna go to the next, uh, to the next panelist, the next presenter. Uh, please, Jennifer, unmute yourself. Uh, we want to see you. She's uh, presenting all the way from uh, Africa, Ghana. Uh, the floor is yours. Your five minutes starts now. Okay. Thank you, Frederick, um, for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. Um, hello, everybody. And my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm a procurement and supply chain manager at the Coastal Development Authority of Ghana and also a CIPS Congress representative for West Africa Region 1. And I'm happy to be part of um, the Enlightening Talk series this morning. Um, I would want to talk about lean management. Next slide, please, Frederick. Um, great. As a procurement professional, we've always um, spoken about the fact that we are supposed to be minimizing costs and maximizing profit as and when and so in our dealings as procurement professionals, I just thought that I'd want to share briefly on the concept of lean management. I know many of us might have heard about it, but 
as we know, um, lean management is an approach, you know, in managing and organizing your work such that you improve your performance whilst eliminating waste along the way. So in um, our daily activities, you know, in, in every organization, um, it is important that we address, you know, this issue of waste. There's a lot of waste that happens in our day-to-day, -day, you know, activities, but you might not even know that it is waste until you have maybe told about it. And so Lean is a systematic approach where we want to talk about how we, we are supposed to eliminate waste in our activities and reduce um, anything that do not add value in our processes. Lean concept is saying that we should eliminate or do away with those processes. So um, we say that to not to take full advantage of all your resources is to lose your efficiency. And if you lose your efficiency, you are going to have stand production. Okay, and those neglected resources include everything from a manufacturing project management tools to even the skills of our staff members. And so lean or the concept of lean is just saying that we should ensure high quality and also customer satisfaction in our dealings. And lean helps in reducing process cycle times. It improves on product and service delivery time, reduce and eliminate the chances of defect generation. In lean, we have what we call the muda or waste, that's the same thing. There are eight of them, things that do not add value in our activities. One of it is defects, you know, waste from a product or service failure. It is defective. Once we say something is defective, then it is waste. We have even inventory as procurement professionals. Sometimes we procure things that I won't say they are not important, but we could use the approach of just in time. All these are um, concepts that lean encourages so that we do not stock a lot of inventory in our warehouses or in our storehouses. We have another waste, which is even um, waiting. That is the waste from time spent waiting for the next process. There are some processes that are not needed. You know, we should try as much as possible in our dealings, in our daily activities to ensure that processes that are not needed are eliminated so that we have some form of efficiency in our work. We also have even motion, wasted time and efforts related to unnecessary movement by people. You know, this got me cracked up when I was researching about lean. When I, I saw that even time, just being idle is a waste of time. And I remember when I was doing this presentation in my organization, Many of them were like, they are no more going to even say hello to anybody. When they come, they're just going to go straight to their decks and work because I have told them that even to stand and say hello to each other is a waste of time. Anyway, but we have eight, because of time, we can't go into all of them, but these are all examples of clear waste in organizations that the lean concept is encouraging that we try as much as possible to eliminate waste. Before I conclude, I want to just give an example. Um, so in a, somebody would say, okay, how can I practically implement what you're talking about? One clear example is, um, for example, if you want to print out a document, maybe you just need one page and you have about a 10 page document. Lean would teach you or the concept encourages that you select current page so that when you issue the print command, you don't have all the other pages coming out because once you click on all pages and uh, whatever printout has come out, you just need only one page. You realize that you've wasted the other pages that you've printed. And this is a practice or it's, a, it's, a, it's something practical that we see day in, day out in our organizations. Another is even the use of the um, printing on both sides. Sometimes just to be able to ensure that the paper that you are using, you are eliminating waste. You can print through your document um, back and front. I mean, like uh, on one sheet, you print your information at the back and in front so that you don't end up printing a lot of sheets which are not needed or which also represents waste. So the whole concept on lean management is saying that 
you should try as much as possible to eliminate waste in your processes. Don't think of it as in, it's only applicable in very big manufacturing organization, but even in your small, even in your homes, you know, in your small little office as a procurement person, have the mindset to always ensure that you eliminate waste. And whilst you do that, you create value. So basically lean management is about concentrating on activities that add value or bring value to you and eliminating or doing away with things that represent waste in your organization. So this is all for now. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much for your powerful presentation. I mean, uh, I got quite a number of questions again to you, but also I'll give an opportunity to the attendees to come in and uh, share their questions via the Q and A button there. But as as you can as you can go back to the background, start thinking about what is the meaning of mooder. What does that word mean? Is it an African word? Is it coming from Ghana or, you know, we, we are curious to understand what you mean by Muda and which companies do you have in mind that have executed the Muda concept? Don't answer me now. We're gonna have some opportunity to speak about that later. So, okay, thank uh, you. Moving forward, moving forward, we are going to navigate to uh, the other side of the world, which is on a different time zone in the USA and we are going to give the floor to one and only Zia, uh, who is going to share his presentation about supply chain or value chain. Zia, please, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself and let's hear from you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Welcome, Zia. Uh, hello, uh, are you listening to me? My voice is coming? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Oh. Uh, thank you, Th thank you, Freddie, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk here. Uh, rather, I will accept that this is my first time that I'm talking on such a forum. And I will start with my brief introduction. My name is Zia Ahmad, and I was born in Pakistan. Then I spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia, where I was working as a purchasing manager. So, in short, I have uh, worked a lot of time for a lot of time in the profession of supply chain, although I've never studied it. And uh, once working in this profession, then uh, I started some, what I will say, an appetite or whatever you call it. And then by 2012, I started writing a book, which I published in 2018 about the profession of supply chain. So today I will be talking about supply chain or value chain. So uh, when we talk about value chain, so first thing, question which hits our mind is that, when we are getting tremendous benefits from effective use of supply chain and techniques and innovations, then why we should even think of switching to something else? This is the first question. Or do we really need to give value chain a serious thought? So uh, moving forward, but uh, as I have mentioned in my presentation that you see the business environment is changing very rap rapidly and it's not in a small way that it, and advanced communications have brought the information accessible to everyone now. So what is happening now that the companies are doing more market research and for finding cheaper products and better supply chain partners. This is uh, what, due to these, what is happening now that the risk of losing valuable uh, associates is mounting and the biggest challenge in the future will be keeping long-term relations both with customers and suppliers. On the side of customers, customers want more benefits from products. And companies are trying to add features which can drive a customer to pay more. Now, on the third side is that the relationship between supply chain partners are more of adversarial nature and not cooperative. And level of trust is low. Companies are trying to push their liabilities to others like, for example, you will see many companies who don't want to keep an inventory. They will try to, either manufacturer will try to push it on the distributor or distributor will try to push it on the manufacturer that you keep inventory, you keep inventory, I will not keep inventory. Then exchange of information is very low 
and it is uh, limited to mutual transactions only. We don't know about others. We don't want to share our information. We don't want to uh, exchange information. So what is what what is my say that we will be forced to change this practice in future, at least to some extent. Now moving forward, what can be the best way to face these threats? Can we keep on going in the same way and think that things will improve automatically? Everyone will say no. We have to think out of the box. And how we can think out of, of the box? We need to increase collaboration between different supply chain partners. We have to develop a strong thinking of doing business together and not against each other. Yani, if we are a manufacturer, we should not think that the distributor is our enemy. We are doing a business together. We can start how we can start we can start by knowing needs and requirements of end user and then educate all of among us to attain these goals together and this way we can develop a long term relation so what is my say here that we need to increase the communications and remove the unnecessary barriers among us and then this is the starting point for building a value chain and it proves to be a catalyst for bringing a positive change on a much wider level. Once the process is started, then all supply chain partners can work together to find areas for improvement in important tasks such as research and development, design of products, services, etc. So what we can get? This will help us in reducing costs and improving profitability for, for everyone. If we achieve this ideal condition, then at every stage of the process, that is from raw material to manufacturing and subsequent delivery to customer, certain value will be added to the product. And uh, the, the more we will add value, the more it will be profitable for everyone. This whole exercise, now we have seen that the whole exercise is done within the perimeters and boundaries of supply chain. So, this makes it clear for us that value chain is not something different, but it is a part of supply chain, but it helps us in doing the things in a better way, slightly better way, or you can say a really better way. Now, we can, have to, uh, we can define value chain as a set of processes and functions within supply chain that adds value to a product or service delivered. So now in this slide, the way uh, the value chain, these steps are lead to the formation of a value chain. Once value chain is initiated, then one moment. Uh, so I'm sorry, I bit, I bit, I've lost. Oh, okay. So now I will go to requirements of value chain how we can re develop a good value chain so what we need coordination and collaboration among the supply chain partners technological investment that we need to develop invest in technology we need to have a good erp for example if we see some of our partners don't have good erp we have to motivate them one way or the other then organizational processes that we need to improve our organizational processes, don't make them too much cumbersome. Strategy and leadership, then employee involvement, we have to uh, motivate our employees to get involved in it. And organizational culture, we need to develop a strong organizational culture. So the areas of improvement can include R&D, etc. cetera. So, uh, in the end, I want to mention one name, Michael Porter, because uh, the way we say that if we find, learn something from someone, we need to mention his name. Michael Porter was the one who developed, uh, in, uh, introduced this concept of value chain first time in his book in, I think, 1985. Uh, what was the name of his book? Yeah, it was the name of uh, the name of his book was Competitive Advantage, Creating and Sustaining superior performance and he used the idea to show how companies add value to their raw materials to produce products that are sold to end users and later on several other people added it 
added valuable additions to it and still the process is going on and i thank you all once again and that was my part of presentation thank you freddy thank you thank you thank you veer thank you very much um i i kind of got lost with your presentation apologies for that but it's, it's loud and clear the the, the 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 value which we get from uh, value chain or supply chain management and alongside with your presentation i'm going to leave with uh, one question as a thought which you will address to the uh, to the attendees later on after we complete this session in the q and a session and my question would be for you to think about the principle of 4r which we all know stands for the, the relationship uh, uh, resilience, um, reliability, and relationship. How do we integrate this relation, this, this principle, to our value chain? So uh, please, uh, we'll get your responses uh, after the next presenter or during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Zia. Truly appreciate. Moving on, we'll uh, get to the, our last presenter who's gonna have five minutes uh, to share her brainstorming ideas. She likes to speak a lot, so I don't want to take a lot of time without further ado, let me uh, bring on board uh, Ludmilla, please unmute yourself and uh, uh, get your camera on, lights, camera action, your timing is starting now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I hope you can you can hear me and see me. I hope because for whatever reasons I cannot see myself. So anyway, I would like to give a presentation today about sustainable project procurement management. And I must say, uh, project procurement management management is really subject which I'm passionate about because I spent all my life working in uh, big projects in oil and gas industry, and I found a lot of um, attention actually, which needs to be brought to the project procurement management now. Frederick, if you can flip for the next slide, please. Thank you. So what is project procurement? The typical project-based company purchases cost represents 65% of their turnover. Three, five times more than they spend on staff and actually paying 10% more then your competitor could turn a profitable business into a failure. It is common today for organizations to procure major items of their projects from other organizations. Some projects today buy up to 80% of their project scope from other external organizations. And actually, it's often these items which are bought from external companies are high risk portions of the project. And after project is over, and actually when management assessing what went wrong with their performance, they often find that this, the work which has been contracted or maybe subcontracted to another external company, which adversely impacted their overall performance. So, but what is a good procurement? Good procurement is context sensitive. One size does not fit all. The project procurement is not commodity. We are always buying some different things and the project is, is unique and diverse. So that's why the procurement are becoming unique as well. It's considered the supply perspective. Value is not an absolute. We need to reach value for money. And lower cost do not come in the cost of business relationship and trust. But actually, do we know for our project, how much does one day of delay cost the organization? How well we manage contractors' performance of our projects often determines how well or maybe how poorly we perform on our own project. So if you will not manage your project procurement properly, you can bring your must win project to failure. And if you bring the important project to failure, you can lose very important clients. And if you start losing the clients, you can start losing the business and organization can be completely out of, of the market, out of business which is unfortunately sad. So that's why I think we should uh, pay proper attention to the project procurement. Can you, yes, thank you. 
So during my 15 years of working experience in different organizations in all gas industry worldwide through engineering, commercial and managerial roles, I have discovered that there are six areas to focus on, six areas of concern and six places to put your attention on to increase the value of project related procurement process in your organization. So I call it the Miller 6 c model. So the first you've got is clarity. I continue to be impressed actually of how often things go wrong simply because of lack of clarity. How often do we start the project without the full picture of what is needed to be delivered? What is the exact client business need? It was the end product should look like. So by actually, what do I mean by clarity? Is to have a crystal clear understanding from the beginning of the project, what is it about? Its goals and objective, requirements and boundaries. What exactly is needed to be delivered in the end? And actually it helps to avoid unnecessary changes and rework during the project execution. So the second element is consistency is to develop your contracting and procurement strategy and to stay consistent with it during the entire project duration. And again, it helps to avoid unnecessary changes. But why consistency is important? So if you will start jumping from one option to another, making random decisions, you will lose the focus and control over the project and won't be able to foresee and efficiently resolve the upcoming problem. Or you might miss the risk or very important opportunity. The third element is continuity. By continuity, I mean sustainability, the business continuity, healthy and trustable relationship with suppliers. The fourth element is collaboration. I mean collaborative procurement and healthy relationship with suppliers, which give way for innovation, win-win solutions for all project participants, and also help improve the entire supply chain and a value chain. So the next element is control. So what I mean by control is to ensure that execution of the contract is on the right track in terms of schedule, budget and scope and project performance criteria are met. So if we don't ensure proper measurement and measurement of our progress, and we don't understand where we are in the project execution and if we don't ensure that contractor is performing well, we might jeopardize our initial uh, commitment in front of the client, which we give in terms of quality, schedule, and cost of the project. As well, our reputation can suffer. Ensuring control can give way to develop the trustable relationship with suppliers. Because after we control it properly, their performance, we can trust that they know what they're delivering and they're meeting our requirements. And the last and is not least element is closing. I must say this element is the most neglected element in many organizations. By closing, I mean they close out the process of phase and they record the whole process and lessons learned. So if we don't do it, we can repeat the same mistake as an organization. The knowledge which team members acquired uh, through the project execution may stay in silence, will not be transferred through entire organization and it will not be shared with uh, other team members. So the organization will continue repeating the same, the same mistakes A learning curve will be missing. So this is why I found these six elements are very important to properly manage project procurement in the organization. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ludmila. Uh, Thank you. Uh, when when, I, when you were presenting, I was just uh, hearing loud and clear that you are a six LP model, if I may call it so, comprises of Prince to a PMP, and uh, of course, SIPs all intertwined and uh, 15 years plus experience. And I truly appreciate. Now, when we, when we, when we come to the session of uh, Q&A, I'd like to prepare you with a question which uh, you will expect you to tell us more about it. What are the steps you would recommend once procurement professional are uh, onboarded into a new project? 
what are the key steps? Do you think the first thing would be to put together a cross-functional team? Would you suggest that the first step would be to really understand what they're buying so that they don't buy something that is not required? Uh, please uh, uh, think about it and uh, we'd like to get to hear from you shortly. So we are now coming to the end of uh, the procurement and lightning talks. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite any questions from the attendees. I'll navigate to the Q&A box in there to see if there are any questions. So far, so good, it's clear, no questions. So uh, on behalf of the attendees, I'm going to jump in and uh, just uh, share my questions. So the first question will go to Fatima, Ms. Fatima, uh, are you there with us? And the question is about uh, blockchain, digitalization, and how it's going to impact uh, procurement professionals. In a few remarks, kindly explain to us where do you see procurement professionals in the next 10 years in terms of transactional and strategic procurement? How is digitalization, how is blockchain going to impact us? And if it's going to impact us positively or negatively, what should procurement professionals do to prepare themselves for this time? Fatma. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, my apology, I never noticed that the, uh, the camera was open. Yeah. Um, just uh, to, um, to answer your question about the blockchain. Now, uh, technology is, uh, is actually something that uh, should come and enhance and add value to everything around us. One of the aspects is the supply chain. Now, in, in my opinion, how does that would, or how would that uh, impact the way that procurement or the supply chain would work? Uh, now, there, are, there is a lot of research on going into the digitalization uh, uh, to the full maturity. And when we are talking about the full maturity, that means involve the uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the blockchain. Now the blockchain has other aspects, which is uh, dealing with the cryptocurrencies. And uh, um, there's a lot of different views in terms of uh, whether people need to use or, or like organization or even countries need to move to consider these, or uh, we just uh, continue uh, doing the work that uh, we are doing. Uh, the blockchain, uh, for sure, it bring a great uh, benefits to the supply chain. Uh, uh, one, one of it is, um, one of it is uh, like the transparency across the whole chain. The second is uh, regarding um, the uh, the uh, uh, removing of the mediums in between. Um, like for example, if you want to, to, to buy a land, uh, you have to go for uh, for an authority in order to register that land, uh, go to the bank in order to get the money, uh, bring uh, like for example, legal uh, person in order to make that, uh, um, that uh, land transfer uh, and the money transfer in very authorized way. Now with the blockchain, you won't be needing all these things because uh, the information would be tracked in uh, through the uh, digital platform and uh, they are not subject to any change. Uh, it is highly secured um, and the access will be given to you and the other party only and you can access from anywhere. You don't, you don't need a medium. Uh, except being on that network uh, in order to do the transactions. Um, many companies um, from the oil and gas sector, I, I know that uh, many companies have started to consider this. Like for example, Schlumberger, uh, they had one of the application in terms of considering going to the blockchain, which is something means that uh, it, is, it is an investment actually to be done by the organization to have that technology because you will need to invest into, in, into building that platform. You cannot do the transaction out, outside of it. Uh, Maersk, uh, as I mentioned, uh, also they started with IBM in terms of the sh shipping and logistics management. 
um, there is a, a high potential that uh, organization may be in the near future and with all this push uh, as a result of the COVID-19 uh, to the technology thing, we will be moving maybe to something, uh, to having that uh, common uh, platform and start removing the medium in between and having a better efficiency and effectiveness. But it comes at a cost of uh, investment that we need to put. And it has also some side effect in terms of the energy generated out of uh, this uh, uh, using this technology. And that would be a concern for the sustainability uh, and uh, uh, for, the uh, for the sustainability or the environmental uh, advocates. So yeah, that's uh, hope that I answered your question. Sure, thank you. Uh, just in addition to that, what risk do you think uh, procurement professionals are going to face with this and how shall we position ourselves? Are you really gonna lose jobs because of blockchain? Because if we'll be doing the tracking, something that we procurement professionals have been doing for the past years before the digitalization. Yeah. Or is it any so, insight from, from you? Yes. So in terms of, uh, of the risk, um, of course the blockchain is gonna, uh, replace a lot of mediums that mean it might get uh, we might get uh, job loss but that's not only with blockchain with a lot of technologies since we started the automation uh, to the digitalization and removing all the administration thing but with that is not the procurement professionals would be affected also lawyers might be affected uh, along with the introduction of uh, the smart contracts which will not need a lawyer to draft uh, the agreement it will be just ready uh, signal from the equipment to, to the supplier and uh, supplier will do the transaction and the agreement is done without any, uh, any ha having any procurement or lawyers or even finance team. No. So these are maybe the three uh, professionals that might be uh, affected and impacted by having this technology on board. Right. And in order, um, and maybe I can add to that, uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to change our jobs. <laughs> Uh, we can still be in the in the in the, the same profession, but uh, we will need to invest more into the emotion and intelligence and uh, having uh, other kind of a strategic uh, way in terms of uh, data analyst uh, analytics uh, when we deal with the technologies. Technology will give us information, but if we do, if we didn't know how to interpret it and use it. Uh, into building a good strategies, for example, for the sourcing or, or, or managing the supply chain, I think um, the robot won't be able to make that yet, make, make that decisions. Well said, well said. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you, Fatma. Uh, we have a question which has just come in from uh, one of the attendees. His name is Shushil Sanchadel. Thank you very much for your question. And it goes to one and only Jennifer Atanga. Please unmute yourself. Uh, the question will be, what are the success factors for leanliness? As you answer that question, please put in context my question of Muda, where that name comes from, and uh, benchmark that principle in an organization. Thank you. OK, thank you, Frederick. Um, in answering the question from Shisho, um, I'll say that there are five factors you know, that we could look at in implementing lean successfully in organizations. And the first is that um, it's committed to the lean program. Management must be committed, first of all, to lean. This is where everybody from the top to the bottom is involved. It involves ongoing communication, listening to suggestions and questions from employees, and explaining why lean is important and then what it means you know, for lean in the organization. So the first factor is commit to the lean program. The second is train the workforce. Everybody should be trained and educated on what it is, how it's going to impact on the business and all that. Um, learning by doing this is a superior way to learn and it requires also local coaching and training, you know, by managers and staff. So the first is committed and um, commitment, sorry, by management. The second is to train the staff on it so that everybody is exposed and educated on the concepts of lean. The third is to have a plan. The organization should have a plan and follow it up. So you would want to have a plan 
And this plan should be broken down into defined steps, clearly defined performance targets, you know, that has been set and monitored. Also have regular meetings that must be held in order to follow up on the implementation of lean in the organization. Managers must also seek to integrate lean in everyday business rather than run it as a separate or a temporary project. So it is inculcated in the daily activities of the organization and it will make it successful in its implementation. Um, the fourth is allocate resources towards it. That is in terms of um, finances or whatever resources will be needed to implement lean. It should be made available to ensure that it is successfully implemented. And finally, use lean tools and methods. So for example, I spoke on just in time. This is also, uh, will I say, it is uh, an approach in lean thinking where then we say that going forward, we are going to ensure we procure things with the concepts of just in time so that we don't over procure things that we don't need for now, which will represent waste. Hold, as I said, holding inventory is waste in itself. You hold inventory, you are locking your money there, you are locking space and all that. So basically, these are the factors that um, I, when we implement, we would be able to have lean successfully in organization. So the first, as I said, is to be committed to the program, train the workforce, have a plan and follow it up, allocate resources, and then use various methods and lean tools to be able to implement it. Um, coming to your question on Muda, Muda is a Chinese word which means wastefulness, idleness, you know, anything that doesn't add value. But specifically, it is wastefulness, idleness, uselessness, okay? Anything that is contradicting to value addition, that is what Muda <clears throat> is. So Muda is a Japanese word. And the company, that I would say implemented or they origin, um, their lean concept originated from is Toyota production system. And that is what has made Toyota who they are because they use the just-in-time approach and they are very successful. So they are benchmarking. We could all learn, you know, from them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Jennifer. I mean, you, you nailed it, you got it right. And that's what you'd like to hear. And next time we need to exercise uh, lean management in, in addition to, of course, reuse, recycle, uh, reduce, we can always benchmark with uh, Toyota. The next question goes to uh, Stan. And the question would be, when it comes to negotiation, this is personally, from my point of view, it's been very challenging to negotiate with uh, OEM being original equipment manufacturers who are monopolistic uh, uh, suppliers in the market. And in, in addition to that, just negotiating with them, looking at the lead time which they give us and the fact that they enjoy that benefit of being the only ones in the market has been very challenging. What tips do you provide us? What uh, ways can we approach when negotiating with this kind of difficult suppliers? Uh, well, this is, I think, uh, one of the most difficult questions uh, and tasks uh, we deal with. Uh, what I realized in my experience, it's, for example, let's take an example. Uh, we are buying a building management system here yeah, from a company. I don't want to give names to avoid problems. <laughs> For example, from a company, an international company, uh, they're present everywhere. And of course, if you buy a building management system, you don't change it every two years. So yeah, you're basically married for life with this system. So the best uh, time to negotiate is when you're buying. You buy the system and you negotiate the annual maintenance for the next 10 years, for example. This is the best time you do it. If you miss this opportunity, of course, they have an upper hand. And uh, unfortunately, we have the same situation now <laughs> at my work. So the only way to deal with it is be open with people, yeah, and talk, yeah. One of the uh, last week, we were given 
one price and uh, I just pick up the phone and then told the guy, see, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, uh, the system is still under the tax liability period and you want us to pay this money, which really doesn't make sense. And we spoke about it and we realized that they need just in this month, they need to make their targets. Yeah, so again, advice is be open, understand what is the cost behind the request and uh, try to push your agenda to the system only. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I think it's it's really a difficult question to answer. But at, at the end of the day, I really appreciate your 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 feedback because it goes down to um, the principles of procurement. Where does each party have leverage? And mm -hmm. my understanding is, when you go to the market, as you said, we have leverage uh, as we hit out with our RFP to suppliers. As time goes by we start losing the leverage. So Absolutely. if we don't get the term, terms and conditions right during this time, if we have the Y axis and the X axis in there, the so leverage is up in there as we start the procurement process. And as time goes by in this 10 year agreement with this OEM, because we wanna have a long term agreement, mm -hmm. we start losing the leverage. And it will be very tough to introduce liquidated damages, to introduce uh, you know, some of those uh, provisions which protect us as the buyers to them at the later stage of, 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 the, of the procurement relationship with them. So there you go. Thank you very much for your answer. The next question Thank goes to uh, Zia. And it's, it's, it's back to the value chain concept. How would you integrate the value chain concept with the principle of uh, 4R being resilience, responsiveness, reliability, and relationship. So Zia, you may unmute yourself and... Uh... Yeah, yeah uh, th thank you, Freddie, for your question, but uh, I would just want to start from another thing. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Professor uh, S. K. Sachdev, Mr. Sushil Kumar Sachdev. Uh, I'm really thankful that he is in the attendees. He sent a question. I will just give you a very brief introduction of him. He is a very reputable and respectable professor, retired right now at the moment, but he has over 50 years of experience in teaching. And I have talked to him many times on the net, and uh, I'm really thankful, uh, Professor S. K. Sachdev, that you are here, and it's my honor that you are here. So uh, as far as the uh, resilience, uh, what, I, what is my point of view that when you are uh, ch ch changing one from one system to other, you must be thinking that the system must be able to absorb shocks and come back to its normal in a very effortless and timeless way. See like <coughs> the current pandemic, what happened? that in the beginning, people started suffering, the airlines started curtailing their operations and the products, there were shortage of products here in USA, uh, the hand sanitizers went out of the market, the napkins went out of the market, I don't know. And one another item, which uh, you people must be surprised, which went here out in the market was bottled water. Whenever I used to go to Costco these days, those days, I asked, where is bottled water? And uh, they say that it finished in the morning. So I was surprised why people are holding bottled water with them. So what happened then? Uh, the way, the, what, what was the alternative way found by people or companies that, okay, if this is the problem, then we will go for online sales, online uh, activities. People, not only the employees are working from, from uh, remotely or online. Uh, of course, we are having this seminar also online now or remote. And uh, companies started selling online. So you have to find ways and means of doing things in a better way or you must be having alternative ways ready with you, which should be workable, which should be e e e easy to change from yeah, you should be having some alternative ways which you can adopt easily, not with a lot of effort that uh, from one system to jumping to other system, it takes a lot of time and effort and you lose time in the middle. Time is very much important these days. 
if you will lose your efforts you will spend too much time from changing one system to other your competitors will simply do it better than you and go ahead of you so thank you and once again i thank uh, thank you freddy and i thank again uh, professor sk sachdev and i request next time mr sachdev please you come on the panelists also because we want to learn from you thank you <laughs> thank you zia thank you very much uh, and and rightly say it it's 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 a wonderful opportunity for us all to interact with the procurement professionals uh, we are learning from each other i'm learning from you zia right now and uh, thank you very much for your answer. I really appreciate it. Next question, uh, we have a question from one of the attendees, Samuel Opuni Boteng. Thank you for your question. And it goes to uh, Ludmila. Internal stakeholders are crucial to the success of project procurement. However, he did not hear anything on the collaboration with internal stakeholders. Before Ludmila gets to answer that, <laughs> allow me to jump in somewhere and say that in Ludmila's element of success in project management, there was one key component of collaboration, which I was looking for. However, I'm not going to speak much about it and let Ludmila respond to your question. Ludmila. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a question, Samuel. So, Actually, what I would like to say that uh, the model which I highlighted for project procurement is not the only pure procurement responsibility, let's say like this, because we have project and internal collaboration between internal stakeholders within one project is very important for success of entire project and not actually only of uh, project procurement. Because if we have our internal stakeholders, it could be, I don't know, it could be any other de department, could be any other div division of the companies, could be your colleague beside you who has whatever any um, clashes between some other projects, uh, is also your internal stakeholders. And you need to satisfy all of them, not only in project procurement, but in all, in order to reach success of the project. So that's why, I would say the collaboration between internal stakeholders is taken throughout entire model, not only particular any piece related to this. Because in order to, for us, let's say, I mean, I'll be very, I'll give like an example, for example. In order, in order for us to reach project success, we need to, I mean, all the internal stakeholders and all the team, all the organizations needs to work in one direction. And in order for us, for example, to get clarity, we need to get clarity and understanding requirements from all internal stakeholders. So it's not only for one particular person in procurement who needs to understand the clarity. Entire organization needs to be, I mean, all the project team needs to be in one page. The same is for collaboration with suppliers. As, uh, for example, procurement professionals can collaborate it from what say could be, I don't know, commercial point of view, not to squeeze in the prices, but at the same time, we need to have a best quality and best performance because we cannot look in the collaboration with uh, our suppliers from only one point of view when we, um, I don't know, discuss the prices or when we negotiate the prices because how the contractor will perform will affect also their other project schedule, project budget. And sometimes project schedule is brings if project delay, that's why I said like how much does the one delay, a one day of delay of project cost us? Because my, very often organizations don't see this, that one delay, one day of de project delay costs more to the organization rather than uh, whatever overspending of the budget. So, and again, this internal collaboration is considered through entire cycle of their six C's. I hope I replied in your question. Frederick, and your question was about, uh, sorry, could you remind me, please? Oh, yeah, what sure. should be fresh procurement, project procurement? Steps. Professional what steps yeah, what steps could we follow? Maybe first three steps which could follow when we are involved in a project. So what I would say actually is the most important. I Maybe I would not say the steps, but I would just highlight maybe the things which are more important maybe rather than steps. So what I think, uh, and from my point of view, and I've seen actually a lot of many organizations are lacking this, 
uh, we still have uh, in organization matrix this matrix or sometimes um, divisional uh, organizational structure and very often departments working in silo there is lack of communication between uh, different departments within organizations and quite often it happens with procurement department as well that's why project procurement lead is a position which um, is a role i would say is works as a link between project management and procurement department so i would say is initially in a project procurement first of all i would suggest to work a lot with project manager beside him on the right or whatever on the on the side with him to work with close collaboration with project management and not maybe with functional division because yes you can do you still have to follow the guidelines the procurement procedures but in the end basically the organizations exist to make money and if entire pro and procurement is supportive functions to the to the entire project is not leading the company because we make the organizations made the project to make money if you provide procurement as a services is one thing one thing but in majority of organization procurement exists as supporting functions that's why i suggest that procurement professionals need to work beside the project manager and support as much as possible in order to reach entire project success because it's not your or my success or your success when we are working in a team is a team success in the end and how successful will be in in a team in a, not a local success but in a global success the more uh, our organizations will be more successful the more benefits we get from the project performance great i hope i replied in a question yes you did yes you did yes you did uh, thank you very much now i see time is not on our side i would like to take one more question i see one of the attendees raising their hand i'm not really sure uh, the intention, but at this moment, we have one more last question from attendees, which is going to Fatma. Ms. Fatma, are you there? Yes, I'm there, yes. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to shoot the question to you. Uh, yeah. What is the rate of acceptance for blockchain by organization in Africa? And what is the future of blockchain in Africa? I know you're not from Africa, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're on the panel. And uh, during, I will <laughs> during, during your research, I'm sure you have some numbers or you can see, you can extrapolate and see where blockchain is going, not only in Africa, but for the rest of the world, starting from procurement, yeah. new in here. You saw the Dubai government saying by 2020, we're going to go paperless. So we'd like to get this kind of insights as your last remark. And we'll move around the circle from for last remark from everybody as we close. Okay, thank you, Fred. Perfect. Now, uh, in order to, uh, I mean, I'm I'm just gonna answer the question in in uh, in different way. First of all, uh, for for the blockchain into into spread and taking a place, um, there are some uh, concept, uh, basic concept. It's regardless which continent, which country, which organization is it. Uh, there should be uh, a, a decision making around whether this investment is, is worthy to, to be made or not, because it's, it's a bit expensive. A lot of risk uh, management uh, and mitigation in terms of as well, the cryptocurrency is very fluctuating. Uh, is the company is willing to go there or not? In terms of the energy consumption as well for this technology, I mean, there should be a kind of a decision matrix, matrix between the cost that it will be putting in order to um, implement these, uh, this technology uh, versus the value that uh, the organization or the country uh, or the continent uh, might get out, out of it. And we might not really see it as, um, as it's a region specific Maybe we can see it as well as industry specific because um, uh, in the example that I've, I've mentioned regarding Everledger, uh, they, they have done that platform, uh, especially for the luxury, luxury goods, part of it was the diamond. And we know that the diamond mining or the stone mining is, is greatly uh, happening in, in Africa. And, and they wanted to track the sources of this, whether 
whether they are kind of a legal market and ownership or they are just part of 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 the black uh, uh, black market um in terms of the industry maturity we can we can just discuss that now we cannot see it like Per, per country, if we can just talk about the shipping, um, I mean, if if a company is is traveling all of all all over the world, they have to really consider whether this technology is available at the places that they are operating or they are interfaced interfaced uh, with. So in general, I mean, uh, how does this would impact or evolve uh, in a place? I would see it in terms of industry. Uh, driven rather than a country or uh, a continent driven. Of course, the country or the region uh, maturity uh, in terms of the development, the, the, the uh, economical development is very important uh, in addition to the political and other things. Uh, however, um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's more, um, I can see it from the industry driven rather than just uh, the region driven. Well, thank you. Thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, just sum it up and uh, give a vote of thanks. But before that, I'd like to give all the panelists at least a minute to give your closing remarks before we get to close down with our vote of thanks. So starting with Zia, you have a minute for uh, closing remarks uh, for your experience during this session and uh, anything that you'd like to share with all the attendees. Uh, th thank you, uh, Frederick Megana. I'm sorry in the beginning I uh, mispronounced your name uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk here. And the way I uh, introduced myself that uh, I have never studied supply chain as a subject, never. I did my MBA in banking and finance, but I have a practical experience of the line only. And then after, Many years then I developed some, you will say, a love or attended, whatever you call it. By, but by 2012, then I started writing a book and now you gave me this opportunity and this was my first time to talk. And uh, maybe I was a bit overexcited <laughs> while presenting. So, and I really learned from others, uh, like I got the concept of blockchain. Really, I will love to study it more. And the way you answer uh, raised question about OEM dealing with OEMs or uh, original equipment manufacturers, but thing really gives me pain these days is that these developed countries, when they are giving instruments or technologies or um, machineries to lesser developed countries, they are giving them mostly outdated things. They are the things which they know that they will go out out of market. Uh, within coming one or two years or within a short span of time. So that is the point which the countries, the other, uh, the lesser developed countries have to think that they have to do this type of research that which technology is going to stay and which is not going to stay. That was my point and really I like the concept and uh, I am again in the end, I want to thank Professor S.K. Sachdev, Sushil Kumar Sachdev, that he attended, I requested him to attend this and he attended it. I'm really thankful to you, to him. And <clears throat> I request you also, uh, Frederick, that next time, please uh, request him to come on the panelist side so that we all can learn from him. Thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, Will. Well noted and um, well appreciating your time and your uh, availability. Next, uh, Stan Love. Please, your final remarks, your punchline. Uh, well, a lot was said, so I won't take much time. Uh, so I think this is uh, this concept of uh, having a lot of panelists and uh, presenting different topics is the best yeah, in the online. Uh, uh, if people want to explore further, I think they can all go, on, go to Google and research or uh, approach the panelists and ask for their further guidance. Yeah, but I think this is the, the best way. Great, thank you. I cannot agree with you anymore. This is one of the best ways because being in the branch uh, committee, I've been serving in SIPs for the last four years, and I can 
tell you that 2020, the year 2020 was really challenging because I'm such an extrovert. I like interacting with people. I like socializing, especially with procurement professional, professionals or like-minded people. But I really miss the brunch events. I always said it, and I will always say that I really miss that too. I saw it fit to have this uh, kind of forum whereby we can get to engage with one another in the pan as panelists together with the attendees. Uh, Jennifer, uh, would you like to say your final remarks? We, we, we will allow you to unmute yourself, okay? Okay. Um, yes. I want to say um, thank you once again for this opportunity. I have learned a lot and um, also as a SIPS volunteer, I'm very happy to be able to network with you all. So, um, but for this program, I don't think I would have met Fatima or Zia or Stanslev, but I'm sure after this event, we've now become a family and that is all networking is all about. So even though I would say COVID had its own negative effect to some extent, it, it has brought some positivity where we have virtual events. I sit in Ghana and I can participate in Abu Dhabi, you know, events and all that. But I think um, it's, been, it's been a wonderful event. It's been very educative. And um, I've learned so much, especially from Laudimila as well. Thank you so much, you all. The ladies really inspire me and um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So thank you. Thank you too. And uh, speaking about the ladies, uh, I'd like to just say on behalf of the committee and the men out there, uh, happy Women's Day to all the ladies. Uh, Thank you. We are keen to get your closing remark. Well, actually, I would like to agree with what was said above by, by the colleagues. And um, you know, in, in every situation, there, is, uh, there are positive and negative sides. So we might say that COVID brought a lot of uh, negative things to our lives, but at the same time, we should appreciate also um, what we also got positive out of it. As Jennifer rightly said, it connected us. It's connected us through entire world. And um, we can exchange knowledge now learn from each other from whenever we are. So that's why I think we should continue doing this. And as Stan rightly said, this is a great event actually. The multiple speakers has really make a difference. And I think is making more interest for participants to like to, to learn new subjects also not like, well, sometimes if it's very long webinar and maybe speaker is not great, you know, which can, I mean, it's very difficult to encourage actually True. to bring, to carry the interest through through the webinar, through entire talks, uh, if especially it's, it's very long. So that's why I think like short talks, it could be like, you bring more interest to the people. And if somebody wants to explore the subject further on, first of all, they, they can learn the subject or they can connect with a presenter through LinkedIn and find out more information. So that's why actually as um, Andrew Mark, I would encourage to uh, encourage everybody to be courageous, to learn from other people, to, to share the information and um, always stay positive. Great, great, I like that. Thank you very much. And you've said it all and I really didn't want to say much. It was meant to be a one hour event but having the likes of Ludmilla, Zia, people who are very passionate in talking, and myself, I like to pass my closing remarks that uh, I really enjoyed this session. I learned a lot from all of us. And specifically, I like to thank all of you for just being willing, responding to my request on LinkedIn to participate in this event and putting the slides together, creating time, it's a weekend here in Abu Dhabi for instance. Tomorrow we are going to work. We should start thinking about tomorrow. We have our families. But then also we've decided to set time aside to be here and share with procurement professionals about these insights. Of course, it goes without saying that presentation skills are very key to influence 
stakeholders. It's part of communication. But at the end of the day, it's all about how well we are able to build those relationships. It starts from now. I'm glad to know you all and to meet you all. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to the attendees. Thank you to Sipsmina, Dana, and everybody who worked behind the scenes to make sure that this event uh, was going to be a very positive event at this. With those few closing remarks, I'd like to close the event and say thank you all. God bless you in all your endeavors and keep on shining in your procurement environment. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye-bye.